Hey everyone, well welcome to the webinar that we are having tonight um, put on by the Alumni Association for the Medical School um, and featuring women in medicine. It's one of the first events that the alumni um, have been able to have sponsored for uh, for the women in uh, alumni and so really excited to, to be doing this tonight. You're going to hear from some um, unbelievable uh, you know, alums and physicians excited to hear about their different careers, wanting to share with you, um, you know, all of their experience and knowledge. So um, without further ado, because we only have an hour and we've got lots of questions. Um, and let me just say one thing. Um, if you have any further questions, as they said in the beginning, please go ahead and put them into the chat um, and we will try and get to them if we can. Um, but we're going to go ahead and um, I will have the panelists introduce themselves and we're going to begin with Dr. Lupo. I hope everyone can hear me. I yeah. have the most uh, letters and numbers because I have Newcomb um, Medical School residency and am currently still a, a clinical professor of dermatology at Tulane. Uh, I started my practice right out of residency in 1984, private practice in dermatology with, with always a focus on aesthetics and involved in some consulting and also started a CME company that specializes in teaching other physicians uh, advanced uh, cosmetic uh, skills. Um, I do have great memories of Tulane, both as an undergraduate and as a medical student as a, and as a resident. And for that reason, I've always felt compelled to continue to support the school, both financially and with my time, and also served on the Dean's Council and the Board of Governors. And I'm happy to be here tonight. Thank you for asking me. Great, thank you. Um, the next uh, physician we're gonna hear from is Dr. Okada. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Pam Okada and I'm a professor of pediatrics at the University of Texas Southwestern here in Dallas, Texas. Um, I'm currently the medical director of a pediatric emergency department in Plano, Texas. And I am also an associate program director for the Department of Pediatrics Residency Program. And um, I too um, love education and teaching. And so one of my other hats I get to wear is a, a co-leader and director of a PEM Pediatric Emergency Medicine Q book. So a question book course and um, textbook to help students in pediatric emergency medicine pass their boards. Um, and so I'm um, very excited to be here with you guys. I also love Tulane and um, have fun memories. Great, thank you. Dr. Rodriguez, would you introduce yourself? Good evening, my name is Maria Rodriguez. I graduated from Tulane Medical School in 1988. I have been in private practice my entire life. Uh, I've served uh, as uh, chief medical officer uh, and as uh, chief of staff and have been um, leading uh, many different types of uh, private practice hospitals throughout my career. Um, I am now uh, president of uh, radiology and envision Phys physician services, which is a physician management organization that has several specialties. Uh, three years ago, I was privileged enough to be asked to be part of the Board of Governors of Tulane Medical School. And so I've just started that journey and hope to continue uh, for many years since Tulane began my, my career and my, my life pretty much. So I'm very happy to be here. Great, thank you. Um, and we'll last hear from Dr. Ula Yule. Please introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Eula Yule. I graduated from Newcomb, Tulane, Tulane Med, internal medicine residency, Hemonk residency, and then business school. And as I like to say, I bleed blue and green. Uh, I've also been very involved with a lot of the organizations at Tulane, TMAA, Dean's Council, Board of Governors, and with a lot of state organizations for internal medicine and hematology, oncology. In January of this year, I took the leap and retired from active practice. I've been in private practice all my life. 
And uh, about a month later, despite many uh, tickets that I had planned for traveling, we got quarantined. So since then, I've been quarantined, reading medical journals and talking to people on the phone and on Zoom. And uh, so far, enjoying it. <laughs> Great. Thank you for joining us tonight. And I'll just make one mention that Dr. Alexis Thompson is going to be joining us just a bit later. So when she does um, get on, we'll do a quick introduction. Um, but I'd like to start off by asking each of you, what are your fondest memories of medical school um, You know, at Tulane? Dr. Lupo, would you start? Well, I think it's by far the relationships and the people that uh, I met on that, in that journey, the, the professors and my fellow classmates. And the, the, I really felt like a family when I was there. And I also felt like the first time in my life, I really was learning something that was useful. I know that sounds a bit harsh about my undergraduate education, but I always felt my undergraduate education was really about learning how to learn and uh, understanding the methodology to really take something and synthesize it in a way that you can extrapolate it to other situations. But for day-to-day -day living, I mean, I still use a lot of what I learned in medical school as a dermatologist. I know when to refer people to internal medicine because I can recognize signs of diabetes, hyperthyroidism, polycystic ovarian syndrome. I mean, the skin really is a mirror to your, your health in general. So the thing that was most exciting to me is I learned so much and I learned it in a very practical manner, a very useful manner. And the, the professors were all very, very supportive and their lectures were all entertaining. And I just had overall a very, very good experience. Okay, great. Dr. Okada. My fondest memories um, really stem from the fact that Tulane believed in me. I had a lot of confidence problems when I came out of undergraduate. Um, I felt like I was competing with gave me that opportunity to be the doctor that I've always wanted to be. And they opened the doors to so many opportunities. And the, the biggest one was Mr. or Dr. Ray. Dr. Ray and Charity Hospital. We could walk through those doors and he would say, Pam, you can tell this patient is having difficulty with his heart. And from the door, Dr. Ray could diagnose patients and he taught us how to use our eyes and our ears and, um, and, and, and to be able to use our, our own clinical skills to be able to diagnose and then help. And so that's one of my fondest memories. That's a great one. Uh, I know, and I'm sure a lot will, sh a lot of people will share memories of charity and had such an impact um, on a lot of, so many of you. Um, Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, so for me, uh, beyond the three hour histology exams that we used to have back then and the charity stories, which, um, which are many, what I remember the most is the people. And this includes the professors as well as the students because what I, what I know today, and I didn't know then, is how, how diverse our class was. Even back in the mid 80s, Tulane was way ahead of everyone else. And the people that they brought into the school, they were very inclusive. We, have, we had students from everywhere in the United States and from all walks of life. And we really got along well, even though we have very different backgrounds and we were very supportive of one another. And so we really had something special. And I think that made us into better clinicians, you know, in the end and better, better people. So, and we had a lot of fun. So I remember that too. So, but it was really the diversity of the people and how, how we all came together, you know, as one. Dr. Yule, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, what, what's your fondest memory? Um, 
Well, I think Tulane and Charity were entirely different physically when, when we were there. Uh, we started in 1969. There was no university hospital. It was a series of buildings around Charity. And I just remember the huge size of Charity. At that time, there were something like uh, 1,500 or 2,000 beds, and it was just patient after patient after patient. But we were thrilled to be there. We had worked so hard to get there. We had a great group of students with us. And uh, I guess it's not fun, but one my first memory of going to gross anatomy class, they actually took a picture of our group and put it in the Tulane Bulletin. And even though it's a black and white picture, you can tell my face is very green. It was, <laughs> it was a moment I'll never forget. <laughs> But we got over that, moved on. Yeah. Well, you know, some of you alluded to um, particular people um, that you, you know, came across during your time here at Tulane. And I'm, we're, many people are interested in, you know, is there one or two, or and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be from Tulane, that really had an impact on your career, um, whether it was a mentor or a sponsor, someone who really um, gave you a lift up. Um, I think that that's a, you know, it's a really important topic, especially for the women graduating these days. Um, why don't we start with Dr. Okada? Hey, um, in medical school, um, doc, Dr. Ray, but most important in my anatomy, her name was Pam. And she was a professor who taught us anatomy and taught us about the pelvic floor and how it kind of swang in the wind after you had a lot of babies. And, and I thought about that, wow, I want to have a lot of babies. And, and so I, I really enjoyed her and she opened her door. It's the first time I've ever had dinner as a young student with a professor, somebody who opened their doors and was always available to just talk about life, talk about anatomy, but then to talk about how we were doing. And she really invested in each student. And it was neat because I had the same name as her and I've never met another woman by the name of Pam. And so that was a natural connection. And then as my career progressed, um, I've had different mentors and advisors in my life. And one of them, was an emergency medicine doctor. Even though I knew I wanted to go into pediatrics, he really felt that women needed champions and he saw it through the career at, at the university that I was, was um, working at at that time, that women spoke differently. Um, made, had different ideas, expressed themselves differently and made it a point to mentor me and help me develop into uh, the person I am. Thank you for that. Yes, I think, you know, a lot of us um, have male mentors, right? Um, because that was oftentimes the people that we saw in those leadership positions. And I think it's, um, that that's a really a, a great experience that you had. Dr. Rodriguez. So um, so folks that impacted my career, so I'm gonna talk about three men. So the first man was my father. He's also a radiologist and he exposed me to medicine and gave me the love and interest for the profession because he's, he's truly devoted and passionate about what he does. And he's still practicing full time today at the age of 85, you know, drives 30 miles to his job. Uh, and even in COVID, he's continued to work fully. Um, and so, so he was my first, my first, the, the first man. The second man was my husband, who's also a radiologist. Um, and he pushed me beyond any boundaries as a clinician and leader in my group. And he, he, pushed me to do anything I wanted and encouraged me to pursue every opportunity that came my way. And then I would say that the third person was my first boss at Envision because he mentored me into my role, the role that I have today, and gave me the opportunity to excel on the business side, which is a role that I never imagined I would do. If you had told me in medical school that today I would be running, you know, a, a, a a service line in a corporation, I would have said, not in a million years, but here I am. So, so you never know where life is going to take you. Did he see something in you, you think, or, or just felt that, you, you know, you were the, I get, he's, the natural? I mean, 
Yeah, he's, he's, I mean, they, he saw something that I didn't even know I had in, in myself and it was not even a way that I wanted to, to go, but you know, I did and you know, here I am. So wow, you know, that, that it was a great opportunity. Great. Dr. Yule. Mm -hmm. um, I think at Tulane, the two people that stand out in my mind were my mentors in hematology oncology at that time, Dr. Stuckey and Beltran. Dr. Stuckey was the consummate teacher. He was the leader. Dr. Beltran uh, was the um, clinician. And uh, I remember the first time he sat me down at a microscope and I saw a plasma cell, I was instantly in love. <laughs> and I stayed with hematology oncology after that. Uh, the other person would be, of course, my husband. He was in medicine, he is in medicine also, and he's still practicing as an intensivist. And um, uh, uh, he, it's good to have somebody that you can go home to and explain what's gone on during the day. He understands. And that's such an important thing for, I think, especially for women in medicine. Great. You know, it, it, that ties into what I wanted to bring up next. And this is again, a, 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 a question that a lot of people asked how, you know, I think women, and it's been shown with COVID, you know, um, our, our, uh, we tend to have a lot of responsibilities outside just our work, right? That affect us. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I'm just wondering how each of you really integrated your career into your lives, whether it was having children, whether it was taking care of elderly parents or taking care of yourself, really, you know, the wellness um, activities that you may do for your life. Um, please share with us um, your thoughts on that. Dr. Rodriguez, would you start? So uh, I've always tried to live by example and practice what I preach. So, so of course, maintain a, he a healthy lifestyle. So of good nutrition, exercise, you know, we don't smoke. Uh, we we um, abide by good preventive care. So we go to all our exams. Um, and then of course, just keeping up with current medical news. So front and center COVID and vaccine news. Um, I think I'm fortunate because I work in, again, in an integrated organization. So I have the visibility to multiple specialties and what's going on in, med in medicine on the whole. Uh, I have four children, but there's only the little one is slightly interested in medicine. So I don't know if I've done a good job at integrating medicine into my, <laughs> into my life. Um, but, you know, we do at home, we, we try to, I mean, we're surrounded by, by doctors because my husband's a doctor, my father's a doctor, my, my mother is in nursing. So, you know, we, we, we live, you know, very in tune to, to, um, to medicine and, and health. That'd be great. Dr. Lupo, let me go back to you. I, I realized I didn't give you a chance to talk about, you know, um, a particular mentor in your life, but also interested in your comments about integrating your career into everything else, how you did it. Well, as far as mentors, I, I think the, the three people who taught me at Tulane, uh, I absolutely agree that Dr. Uh, Seathorpe Ray uh, perfected the art of a true physical diagnosis and without any uh, additional tools. Um, and the other two that I would mention would be Jeffrey Ellison and Leon Weisberg in neurology. They were exceptional teachers. I almost went into neurology because I was just so fascinated by their ability to not only be diagnosticians, but educators as well. I have to give a shout out to Dr. Wesley Galen. I don't know how many of you all know her, but she's 10 years older than me. And I'm a dermatologist because of Wesley Galen, because the year that I applied in the match for dermatology, there were only two spots at Tulane. And there was another female who had applied, very well-deserving. She got the first slot. And when discussing the second slot, the acting chief at that time said he didn't want two married women at the same time in the same year. This was 1979, uh, because what if they both got pregnant at the same time? Galen went to the mat for me and said, if you deny this young woman a position merely because she's a married with two children. She said, I will resign from Tulane. So they took me. And to this day, I thank her every time I see her. And she says, no, Mary, you deserved to it. I go, yeah, that's not the point. I wasn't going to get it if you hadn't done what you did. And then I'd have to say Larry Milliken, 
who became my chair um, when I was a first year resident because that temporary chair was just a temporary chair for a very short period of time, thank God. And we got Larry Milliken, who was an incredible advocate for women. Most of the female dermatologists had come through Tulane. I mean, there would be years where we'd have first, second, and third year residents, and they'd be all women, maybe one token male. So he was very much an advocator in a very appropriate and supportive and fatherly way for women in our specialty. And I really can't speak enough about them. As far as handling things, I am very good at a few things. One is compartmentalization under stress. I deal with things as I had to deal with them. I also think another thing I am is the eternal optimist. And even when things are absolutely horrible, I go, they will get better. And I don't dwell in the negative of the moment. I'm one of these people, I never get terribly happy when things are really, really good, but I never get really depressed when things are really, really bad. I manage to keep everything in check so that I don't have this tumultuous life where I'm going from ups and downs. And I think that's a really positive thing when you, I have two children, been married for 40 years, and you just have to, uh, you can have it all, but you can't have it all, all at the same time. So you have to pace yourself, you have to prioritize, and you have to compartmentalize. I appreciate that. That's a that's a really great, um, I think, comment to make that, you know, you really can have it all, but it might not be at the same time, just like you said, that's, uh, that's great. Um, before we go on to Dr. Akata for her answer, I'm going to take a brief moment to let Dr. Thompson, who we're so um, happy to have join us, introduce yourself, please. Sure, I'm so sorry I'm late. Uh, it's a clinic day. <laughs> I'm Alexis Thompson, um, and um, um, I'm a, a currently a professor of pediatrics at Northwestern, and I'm a pediatric hematologist, and um, and I am a, a Tulane Med School alum. Um, yeah, great. Okay, good. Well, we're um, discussing, you know, how have you successfully or how have you struggled with integrating your career um, into your, the rest of your life, whether it be with family, um, with parents, with other interests or wellness? So Dr. Akata, would you um, share your thoughts? And Well, I first want to applaud you guys for using the word integration. Before we used to always talk about work-life balance and there is no balance, okay, as a physician. And so the integration part with family as one, it's, it's like a marriage of three things, right? A polygamy, there's family with your spouse or your significant other, your brothers, your mother, you know, your, your children. And then there's the next part, yourself. And how do I take care of my health and my safety and my spirituality? And then there's the work and the, the kind of the integration of all three spheres has, um, really come into more favor now as, as understanding that it's, it's really hard to balance all three and there's no magic right answer. And so how I've looked at it over my the past 20 years, I've been married for 34 years. Um, I have five children and what I had to figure out and, and I was looking at one of the chats, you know what, I had to be okay with not being practically perfect or doing everything the best or being first, I had to be okay with that. I had to be okay that, hmm, maybe we're gonna have cereal for dinner, okay? <laughs> and I can't get a nice gourmet meal, no. Um, I also had to ask for help. Um, I had to, my, I depended a lot on my husband who is a family man, he loves to cook, he's a lot of fun and just kind of went with the flow. And so I, I look back and go, you know what, one of the things is to find that partner who really um, joined in my journey and participated in, in helping me become the best um, father and wife and mother that I could. Um, and then the other thing was to find people to do things that I couldn't do or I just didn't have the bandwidth to do. And so that included cleaning and picking up and um, kind of the you know laundry and, and other things that I sort of like doing, but you know what? I was okay with asking for help. Great, those are some 
excellent um, examples of things that you can do. Um, why don't we, Dr. Thompson, share with us, you know, how how is your career integrated with your the rest of your life? I, you know, I, I will be the first to say I am not sure that I've always done it well. <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to, to, to acknowledge that. Um, I've, I've kind of been willing to just give myself a break on some of it and sort of um, um, there are times when I, I really truly appreciate having people around me that will be honest with me about times when I am just kind of a little off on one side than the other. Um, I appreciate having people that I love being able to tell me what they need and there are times when that's kind of what I need you to do because I, I'm otherwise I may end up being more attentive to something that seems urgent right in front of me. Um, I um, there are times when disconnecting though from from it is really from my work um, and really just doing things that are either fun or relaxing or just completely non work related um, has helped tremendously. Um, but um, I, I can't say that I have. Um, I don't know that there is a one size fits all solution on how you make it all happen. I love the concept of integration. Um, I think that for me, I don't know that I could necessarily say that I have a work self and a home self. Um, um, I, I appreciate that. Um, I think as a leader, for instance, it's been to me so important to be sure that I see the people who work for me as as whole beings and being able to be sure that I understand what else is going on in that person's life. That's the only way I'm going to actually get the most out of my team members. If I can't acknowledge not only their role on my team, but also sort of what the rest of their life looks like, um, it really helps tremendously to sort of make sure that people know that they're valued. Um, and so I think I'm probably better at, at doing that as a leader. And, and I, I recognize I will accept as a, as a failing that there are times when sometimes I don't listen to my own advice. <laughs> right. Great, thank you for that. Dr. Yule. Um, I uh, agree with uh, Dr. Okada entirely. Uh, when I went to Alexandria, which is a city of about 40,000, uh, back in the um, uh, early 80s, we had no daycare, we had no childcare, we had no uh, cell phones, we had no uh, beepers, and we had no ER physicians. And oncology patients tend to get sick at night. And so I had a big old Oldsmobile station wagon and my kids think they grew up in it because I would put them in the station wagon, go to the ER and they would sleep while I went into the <laughs> ER. My husband was in the OR. So. <laughs> um, uh, but after a few years of that, my husband gave me an ultimatum one year and he said, you're either going to go to a psychiatrist or I'm going to get you a piano. I took the piano. <laughs> Uh, I also decided at that point that while you could do it all and you could have it all, it wasn't sane and it doesn't work. And at that point, I just said, you can't sweat the small stuff. You have to decide what has to be done right now. You can't make a grand plan. You take it as it comes. And that's the way we ended up uh, doing things at home. Everybody pitches in. Everybody does what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think in medicine, you just have to work things that way. Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this next question has to do with, um, you know, us being women in medicine and, um, and I think the conversation around um, implicit bias and micro and or macro aggressions is, um, is one that is often discussed these days, which is good. That's great. Um, but just wondering, you know, how, how has that affected your career or your life and how have you managed that what what have your bit what have you been your approaches to to dealing with those experiences dr akata could we begin with you okay wow so when i have my children were very young and i'm a pediatric emergency medicine physician and so it was nice because i could go part-time i i worked 75 percent time and um, uh, was able to do a lot of weekend shifts and night shifts. And so during um, that time when the children were young, um, I went to my boss at that time, my boss boss, big boss, and I research, and I'd like to, to work on a master's of clinical science and um, go to the university and get another degree. And he looked at me and said, Hmm. 
Well, don't you have other priorities? I don't think that you have it in you and I don't think you, you have priorities at home. And I didn't know what to say about that. I kind of looked at him and thought, well, back to you and, and I will think about this and talk about it with another person. And it was, a, I have another, an, another boss, a male mentor. And he said, well, um, why don't you think about it? And if you want to go ahead and pursue a master's, then I support you 100%. And so I just had to talk about it, think through it, and then maybe find other advocates, um, advisors, and champions to help me figure out if I could actually do it. Tell me what my blind spots are. Am I really blind to something that I don't see because I want to do it all? Or I can do it, and that was just somebody who was trying to tell me otherwise. Okay, great. Yeah, it's unbelievable sometimes the things that you hear. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez. So mine was a little different approach. Uh, you know, whenever I get asked this question, you know, I think that I'm, that I, that I, I my approach was, is different from other women. So I have to say that I have spent my whole life going about my goals without feeling underprivileged or unspoken for. And so I looked as at what others saw as a barrier in front of me and I, and I made that a strength or an opportunity. So if someone told me, you know, you're a, you're a girl, you can't do this. It made me wanna do it a hundred times better and faster and sooner than, you know, whoever told me that. And so like say I had my son, my first child on a Friday and Monday morning I was at work. And my second child I had, and I went back to work in a week. And that's because I wanted to do that. And I didn't want to fall into the, I had, I have a big family, you know, they took care of the children. And to me, you know, my work was super important and my, and being at work was, was very important. And so for me that it was free, it was freeing that I was able to do that, even though it, it shocked everybody. Like, how could you have had a child three days ago and be standing doing that? So, so for me, you know, sort of this empowered me. And again, I never felt, you know, I competed, you know, with, for every job with every man and did it better. And, you know, now that I'm in this role, then I, I feel like I can help once you get into the club, sort of, so, so, sort of, um, you can help other women, you know, bring, bring, come with you and get to that level. So again, I, I, never, I never felt that my gender was a, was a weakness. So, you know, I took it and twisted it to my strength. Okay, great. Dr. Thompson, would you share your experience? So it, it's, it's been a bit of a mixed bag. Um, I think that some of the areas early in my career where there was clearly a difference was because um, I, I spent a, I spent an early part of my career as a, a basic scientist and, and, you know, everyone talks about team science now, but now, and even in the past, there's a certain amount of individual recognition that many top scientists are still looking for. And so the question is, is that, you know, but, but yet to get started, you really have to have collaborations. And so one of the challenges that I found was really being the person that you, you aren't necessarily the person that someone naturally chooses to collaborate with because you are other. And so, um, and so just simply recognizing that is what it is and then trying to A, identify what I want and then to try to identify those people who had similar interests and were willing to help me. Um, it was never an issue about working hard, but there just are times when opportunities are simply go to other other people. Um, and um, and then, but then I would say that the real learning message from me was that as I got to the position where I knew that I could pay it forward. You know, that was, I think that many women, it, it, it is something that we, and it's really just not about nurturing. It really isn't that. I think many of us exquisite, understand exquisitely the environment that we're in. And that if there's any opportunity for me to identify women who, um, who are looking for opportunities, 
um, women who are incredibly talented, but that they're going unrecognized, that they're not necessarily being heard. Or every once in a while, a woman needs a kick in the butt because it's just like, you know, why are you putting up with this? <laughs> because you don't have to. Um, and, um, and so really being able to, to take my life lessons and to be sure that there are women who are um, in my immediate space and, and certainly women who, who I interact with it on a variety of different other um, uh, committees and, and with other hats. Um, but I, th I think that, you know, that, that to spend much time sort of feeling like I, if things are unfair is, is really pretty draining. Um, let's just say that they are unfair <laughs> and, and move on um, because then it's a matter of, okay, well, who are my partners? Who are my allies? Who yeah. do I need to be worried about? Um, but as long as I have a better appreciation for the landscape, then it's up to me to make the most of it. Great, thank you for those comments. Dr. Lupo. Well, so in the 70s and 80s, um, things were a little different. There was no maternity leave. So um, you had to, at least I had to, uh, save up all my vacation time and sick time and literally work, although uh, on a Friday I worked and I went into labor Friday night and took my time off after because I wanted to be home with the baby for a while. So it wasn't, no, there wasn't anything special that they did for you, which in now, I know young people today are absolutely shocked about that. And, you know, I, I think what benefited me is like Dr. Rodriguez, I am a person who really needs to be told I can't do something because that's when I will do it the best. And I'm extremely stubborn and I, um, I'm a contrarian by nature. I question things and I have always been a person who has challenged authority. I've never felt intimidated by a professor. Um, I've always felt like uh, it's a matter of timing where people are where they are. And I didn't, I was never not respectful, but I didn't necessarily revere them because I thought that they were the all uh, omnipotent who could tell me what I should and shouldn't do. Having two older brothers enabled me to challenge and uh, forcefully uh, protect myself when situations arose that I was being treated unfairly or inappropriately. And uh, as a result, you get the reputation of being someone that you just don't mess with. And as a result, um, people don't mess with you. So I am, um, I just urge people to understand what your limits are and what you, what you will accept and not accept in any relationship and to draw the line in the sand and simply say, this is, this is yes and this is no and not allow someone. And if you get someone who's a barrier who has the ability to be a barrier, hopefully you'll have someone to help you or you can go around that barrier and find a, an alternate route to get where you're going. Okay, thank you. Dr. Yule, your thoughts on? Um, I'm thinking way back, the only time that it was really, really vocalized to me, I think I was a freshman, just got to college, and I was sent to see my advisor about what I wanted to do with my life. And he asked me, and I said, I wanted to go to medical school. And he just looked at me and he said, don't even bother. They don't take girls. So, of course, that was an impetus to just do it. <laughs> And then once I got into medical school, um, there wasn't anything that was said, but we kind of knew that guys were jealous that we were there because after all, we were going to drop out of medicine anyway. We were going to have a family. And at that time, like Mary said, there was no such thing as maternity leave. My first child was born at the end of my residency. The second child was born at the end of my fellowship. That's the way it was. Um, I knew one girl who was a couple years ahead of me who was at the top of the class and her husband was in the class and uh, she got pregnant and she just plain dropped out, never went back to medicine. Uh, so it, it was a different time. Um, uh, I can't remember anything else overt than those episodes, uh, I'm sure, other things were said, other things went on, but uh, those are the only things I can remember. Okay, great. You know, um, as you as you're, you all are speaking, I'm thinking it, it is really a different time, right? And so sometimes it's hard to 
to necessarily say that you would do the same thing now that you would have done then. But in the context of that, what, what would you tell your younger self? What might you do differently um, in your career? Um, you know, that may change it or, or in whatever, whatever capacity. Dr. Thompson, do you want to start? Sure. I, I think if I had to talk to my younger self, I would say, give yourself a break. Um, I think that I, I certainly was someone who was very demanding of myself. Um, and in many ways that was very motivating, but I also realized that it, um, it, um, it, it, in some ways I could have done as well as I think I've done without necessarily being as hard on myself as I think I was in my, in my earlier iteration. Now I, I accept my shortcomings, um, um, you know, gladly. And sometimes even, even, even out loud with, uh, with in the appropriate setting with team members or colleagues, um, it's a lot more fun. Um, but um, so I think if I had to, if that would probably be the one thing that I would, uh, I would tell my younger self. Great, Dr. Lupo, what would you say? Well, I, I will be honest with you. I wouldn't change anything. Uh, I feel like every challenge that I had made me a better person. I don't think this life is about having everything be perfect. And I think that you 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 have to have and always keep a, a belief in yourself. I was fortunate to be, I you know, like Lady Gaga. I was born this way, and <laughs> I have been this way. Even when I was very, very young, I was very um, opinionated and outspoken and could be argumentative. I was rarely getting good grades in conduct because I would, you know, I would sass, I would mouth off, I would, I would express my discontent and unfairness in any form is something that I would always vocalize. I would often stand up for the underdog and, and uh, champion their cause. Uh, so it, it I, I really, I love where I am and I wouldn't change a thing. And, uh, and like what Dr. Thompson said, I always uh, forgave myself when I would make a mistake because that's part of the learning process. So I didn't dwell, like I said, it has to do with my, my inherent d demeanor that I don't dwell on negative things and I take it in and then I just move on and uh, try don't don't make the same mistake twice. So you know, I just like to be an encouragement to young girls that you know. Sometimes, if things are easy, I don't think you appreciate it as much as when things are difficult. So when things are difficult, look upon it as a way to um, to, to to gird your loins, as they say, and become a better person. Because if everything is always easy. I guarantee you at some point, it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be pleasant. And you want to have the skills and be able to draw upon uh, challenges you've had in your youth that you can handle things as you get older. So having challenges when I was young, I thought was a good thing for me because I grew up, you know, sort of in a, a tough situation. Uh, the father was a cab driver and I was a latchkey kid. And, uh, you know, had to kind of make my own way and, you know, cook, cook dinners sometimes and do those sort of things. And all of those things made me resilient and made me confident in my ability to get through difficult situations. Mm -hmm. A real trust in yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dr. Rodriguez, um, what, do you, what would you tell your younger self? So I, like Dr. Lupo, I feel very fortunate uh, to have had a lot of positive in my life. I, I feel like I, I came, I'm, I, I was always where I was supposed to be. Um, I had a very rosy upbringing, even though I'm an immigrant and my parents left everything behind to give us a better life uh, here in the United States. Um, but, you know, I had a very supportive family life. Um, I really... Um, I really all along, you know, did the things that I wanted to do with, you know, little hurdles. Um, I would say, you know, part of the reason why I went into medicine, uh, besides my dad, was because I thought that medicine would expose me to 
to another side where, you know, I would, I would see things that I would n normally not see within my family or in my lifestyle. Um, and it did, you know, it matured me. Um, I would say that I, the only thing I would do differently, you know, there's so much life and living, you know, in medicine, I would say, you know, you really, you really take in, you know, how the, what life is all about and, you know, what is, what is good and what is bad. So it's, it's a lot of living. I would, that's how I would describe it. So I would just, if I had to do something different, I would just, I would be more, assert, even more assertive and don't be afraid to take, take on even more roles and be more aggressive so that I live more. Because to me, like, you know, medicine is, is living. That's all I have to say. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and that's, you know, those experiences in life is what life is all about. We have very little time on this earth. And uh, I feel like if, if I even did more than I'm, that I'm doing, I would get more out of it, you know, more enjoyment and more life. Thank you. Dr. Yule. Yeah. Um, I wish that I had had more of an idea of what it was really like to be in practice in hematology, oncology, and also about the business of medicine, because we knew very little of that. We, we lived between the medical school and charity hospital, back and forth. Uh, and it was a real awakening when I got to the small town and opened up an office, and I didn't even know you had to get a business number for, for taxes. Uh, the, uh, the other thing is, uh, I wish that I had just made myself spend more time with the kids. Medicine was so encompassing that really that always came first. And then I had to work in the kids around that. Um, I wish I had had just taken time to pursue other interests, take more time off, take care of myself, exercising, things like that. Uh, if you think back on it, if I think back on it, if I had done those things and just said, hey, I'm leaving, I've got to do this, what would they have done? Uh, it's come full circle and now it's accepted, but what would they have done if I had done that? Nothing. I was going to be there the next morning. I was going to take care of my patients, but um, you know, it was just the idea that you were supposed to do this, so you better be there. Um, but uh, those are the things that I, I miss that I wish I had done. Yeah, some of those things you were just referring to, I do think that it's, I'd like to think that that's more, getting becoming more common. I think that it's yeah. definitely something yeah. that, um, you know, certainly I think in academic programs, as you train, mm -hmm. are promoting those those types of um, right. just, you know, values, really, and, right. and uh, commitment to wellness. So, mm -hmm. Dr. Akata. Um, I think for me, uh, I wish that I was okay with conflict. Unlike Dr. Lupo and Dr. Rodriguez, I had, I had a hard time sticking up for myself. Um, I, I'm an introvert by nature. I was very shy by the, the and, and I, can, I can remember the day I had my third argument in my whole life. I thought it was an argument um, with my lab partner. Her name was Kathy. And she and I had an argument and I felt so bad about this conflict. I thought it was conflict. And she looked at me and she said, Pam, what are you talking about? We're still friends. We're having a discussion about some histology thing. We're having a discussion about this and this is not conflict. This is a discussion. And, and I thought about that and my whole life, I had this fear of conflict and a fear of not pleasing everybody. And I had to come to grips with that when I started my journey in medicine because I wasn't going to be able to please everybody. Um, I, was, I was going to deal with conflict and I needed to learn how to do that. And, and so I wish I had learned that more quickly and learned that um, maybe earlier in my, in my life, um, but uh, with time and grace and people around me and hanging out with people like Dr. Lupo and Dr. Rodriguez, because they were my advocates, right? They were the ones that helped give me the courage to stand up for myself. And, um, it, and, and that was um, a blessing for me. And, and Kathy was the one during medical school, my lab partner. 
Um, the other thing that I wish to, uh, just like Dr. Liss was saying um, about spending more time, not to always be in such a hurry. Um, my husband would tell me, Pam, life's not an emergency. Okay, life's not an ER, you have time. And so to be able to spend more time enjoying being in the moment, taking care of the fun stuff at home, being at the school parties. I'm trying to remember picking up number three from the ice skating rink while I'm picking up number four from some other event, just enjoying that moment instead of rush, rush, rush. And, and so I, I agree with Ula 100% there. Thanks for sharing that. You know, I think um, with this group especially, but I, just this you know, all of our experiences, all, all your experiences, we could talk forever. Um, but unfortunately we are coming to the end because we scheduled this for just an hour. But I think it goes to show that maybe we either need to have more of these or, you know, maybe we'll expand it the next time. Um, I wanted to give everyone a chance just to have, you know, give some closing remarks or closing thoughts. Um, uh, today, a lot of, I've been able to sort of keep track of the chats um, and incredible, like really, really positive comments. So. Um, I'm just going to start at the top, Dr. Lupo. Well, I do a lot of mentoring for young women. Um, I would encourage any of you who are on this call to reach out to any of us on the faculty after the fact, because you might be like Dr. Okada and be a bit shy and not want to talk uh, in an open forum. The best way to get me is through my Instagram account and direct message me at Lupo Dermatology. Um, that is really the best way to reach me because uh, it doesn't go through the normal channels. And I often check that um, periodically. So uh, during like the, even the, the evenings at home while I'm watching television, I'm bored. So, um, but we're here for you. We're, we agreed to do this call because we want to do what we can to uh, reach down and help you achieve some of the personal and professional successes that we all have enjoyed. So please take advantage of that and feel free to reach out to us. Um, Cynthia Hayes knows how to get in touch with us also if you need uh, additional resources. And thank you again for tuning in. Thanks for sharing that with us. I do think I've always been impressed by the alums at Tulane. You guys are really connected. Um, I'm a little jealous. Dr. Rodriguez, your closing thoughts. So I would say uh, to young women and to all women that gender is your strength. It's not a handicap. Don't look at it that way. It allows us to see the world from a much more comprehensive perspective. So we can use it to our advantage in everything that we do. I would say that we, today we have a responsibility to open the door to others, to other women. Uh, and, but at the same time, lead as a leader, if you're a leader, lead for everyone, not just exclusive for, to women uh, or to any, any ethnic group or any race. We don't wanna reverse discriminate. We wanna be inclusive and we wanna right any wrongs of the past. That's very important that we take on those, that responsibility. Um, I would also say, you know, three things that have always worked for me is always see the glass half full always go after the opportunity and adapt to all situations because the world is ever changing. And you know, if you do those three things, you will, you will be successful. So thank you. Thank you for that. Dr. Yule. Um, I'm very encouraged whenever I talk to the younger people. Uh, my older daughter decided to go into medicine in 2000 and at that point her class was 50 50 men women and i was just amazed my class was 12 out of 160 women um it's um uh, uh it's amazing what they come in knowing that we didn't know uh it's amazing what they what they learn what they come up with it's amazing the backgrounds that they came in with they come in with art history with music things we had to do biology or chemistry that's all we could choose from uh, so it's just a whole new world. And I think it's going to become a more and more feminine world. And as that occurs, a lot of this hierarchical stuff will probably, some of it will still be there because that's just the nature of people to be competitive and want to be the best and fight for it. But I think some of it will become kinder and gentler as time goes on and the women are, are more apparent. Um, uh, so I, I would encourage people 
when they get a chance, come to the medical school, come to the functions there, talk to the younger people, the students coming through. And I think you'll be very encouraged about the future of medicine if you do that. Love that. Thank you. Dr. Ricardo. Um, I want to um, just let all of you guys who are out there listening, I know that um, you, there's medical students, there's residents, there's junior attendings, all the way up to full professors listening. And um, for the medical students and the residents and the fellows and junior attendings, I just to let you know that you are leaders as well. When you signed up, to be a physician and you took the Hippocratic Oath and you donned that white coat, you took a leadership position. And so you're leading from the middle. And so whatever you choose to do, whether you're, you're taking care of that sick child on the floors, um, you're in clinic, you're at the grocery store, people are looking towards you and the nurses, the RTs, your staff, your colleagues, your family. And so you are a leader and, and just to embrace that and then to just work and, and, and draw out your gifts and, and share that with other people wherever you go. So inspiring, I love it. <laughs> Dr. Thompson. So I, I think if I had to conclude, there would probably be a couple of things. One, and I would say this to the people who are on the younger end of the spectrum, you know, it may be impossible to imagine the full trajectory of your career right now, and that that's okay. Um, there are very few of us who have had the great fortune, or maybe you can call it great fortune, of having a career that was truly linear. I must tell you that some of the twists and turns in my careers, um, while there are times when I wasn't quite sure it was around the bend, have really been some really important personal and professional opportunities for growth. Some of them are inflection points and knowing what an inflection point is, having people who are around you that can help you to navigate, the, a, a, to understand that you have an opportunity to change and change for good, um, or that, you know, that there's a pitfall there that you want to avoid, but having people that you trust around you is so important. And then the final thing is be authentic. Um, whatever it is that you think you're about or that you want to be, own it and, and really um, respect that part of yourself. Um, figure out how that all works together. It, 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 is, um, it, is, um, it is possible for there to be so many different kinds of voices in the room right now in, in medicine and know that much of what your journey is or what your goals are in the future are probably gonna make us all better. I, I love those thoughts and I just have to reiterate, you know, just taking the risk and going for it um, and not, you're not going to necessarily know how it's going to turn out, but that's okay. You know, um, it's, uh, you know, careers can be very exciting that way, but you have to, you have to sometimes take that risk. So thanks for those words. Well, we are at the end of the hour and um, you know, I just have to say I'm so privileged to um, be part of this. So thank you for allowing me to moderate the session. Um, I certainly want to thank all of the um, watchers or listeners. And, um, and then of course, to our panelists for such a robust and, you know, really um, thoughtful discussion. So thank you um, for taking the time to do this. Um, a few housekeeping, housekeeping things. If you did put a question in the chat that wasn't answered, we're going to work to um, get those back to you with an answer. We'll send them to the panelists. Um, and also, you will all be receiving a link um, to this webinar um, once they sort of have it all edited um, or in a package. The last thing I'll say is that there is going to be a survey um, at the end um, after this closes down. Um, and so please, it's a quick survey. So if um, the alumni office is definitely interested in your feedback. So um, with that, I will say goodbye. Keep your eye out for other webinars uh, coming up at Tulane. Thank you.